It is wonderful to be uh, among you. I thank God for this opportunity to uh, be able to speak from God's word once again. Uh, this morning, I would like us to be introduced to three people from the Bible, all right? Three individuals from the Bible. And this is a Bible passage that is familiar to all of us. And so uh, this is a book from the Bible. Uh, I'm going to call your attention to the book of Philemon. Um, and so we are going to look at three people. One is Paul, the one who wrote this letter. We are also going to look at Philemon, the person to whom this letter is being written. And we are also going to look at Onesimus, the person for whom this letter was written. So three people, Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus, the person writing this letter, the person to whom this letter is being written, and the person for whom the letter is being written. So let's read the letter quickly, and then we will get into it. The book of Philemon, reading from verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. So at this point, we are somewhere in AD 60 or 61. Paul is an older person by now, and he's also in prison. Uh, Timothy is with him, and he writes to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. So Philemon is most probably in ministry, and that's why Paul is calling him as a fellow worker. To Aphia, our sister, most probably Philemon's wife, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, who most probably would be their son, Philemon and Aphia's son. Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets at your home. So they didn't have church buildings back in AD 60. They met in the houses of people, and so Philemon had a big enough house where they could accommodate a few people, and so the church gathered there. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. This is Paul writing to Philemon. I thank God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Let me read the reading and then we will come back and look at all of this. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. This is the third time Paul is making reference to the fact that he is a prisoner. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, 
sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is a very personal letter written by one individual to another individual. How did it find its place in the New Testament? I hope we have the answer to that by the end of our study together. And I assume that you are familiar with these three characters. By the way, one of the best ways to study the Bible is to do character studies. It's the simplest way, and it's a very good way as well. So pick up individuals from the Bible and make character studies on them, and we have much to profit through that. So here is Philemon, most probably a citizen of the city of Colossae, it is to Colossae that Paul wrote that letter called the letter to Colossians. So most probably he is a resident of Colossae. He is a rich man, has a big house. Therefore, there is a church meeting at his house. Now, Paul says, I always remember you in my prayers. So it seems like he had a close association with Paul. He says, Paul says, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus. That means there are people coming into contact with me who speak to me about you, all right, and I'm happy to hear about your faith in Christ. You know, when Uncle and I travel to different places, we meet a not, lot of NTC folks, our Bible college folks, and we ask them about, you know, our friends and fellow co-workers, and when we hear good reports of them, uh, we are very happy, right? So Paul says that I hear good reports about you from a number of people, and I am happy that you have this kind of faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. So Philemon was a man who also expressed great love to all the saints. Now, Paul, whenever he writes a letter, this could be a Bible study topic all by itself, all right, just in case you're interested. Study all of Paul's prayers that he includes in all of his letters. When he writes to the Romans, or when he writes to the Colossians, or when he writes to the Ephesians, there's always a specific prayer that he includes, especially in the early parts of the letter. So Paul's prayer for the different churches could be a Bible study all by itself. Now, here is Paul's prayer for Philemon. He says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Why? so that you will have full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. So Paul is saying in the book of Ephesians, he prays for the Ephesians that their eyes would be opened so that they would understand every good thing that they have in Christ Jesus. So that's he's praying for revelation. Here he is saying, you be active in sharing your faith with other people and that would result in your becoming aware of every good thing that we have in Christ Jesus. Very unique, you know. Most probably Philemon was brought to faith by Paul himself, which is why we note that tone with which Paul is writing to Philemon. You owe your very life to me kind of statements probably implies that Paul is the one who brought Philemon to faith. And now here is the pastor's prayer for one of his people, that you would be active in sharing your faith. Verse 7, your love has given me greater joy, great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. So that's individual number two, actually, Philemon, the person to whom the letter is being written. I hope you're not getting distracted with people coming in and going out. Please give us, give me your full attention. So Paul is the one who is writing this letter, right? The person who is writing this letter. Now, you know how Paul functioned. He was a Pharisee, right? So he's one of 6,000 or so people during that time. So he is part of a very elite group of people, all right? He's a very religious kind of person. And you know how he began his life, how his story begins in the Acts of Apostles by persecuting Christians, right? He is engaged in what was called, what is now called Gharvapasi. Have you heard of that term, Gharvapasi? Yes. This is something that Hindu nationalists do in India by trying to bring Muslims and Christians back to Hinduism. 
they call it ghar vapasi ghar means house vapasi means to return so ghar vapasi means to return home that means you christians and muslims are prodigal sons and daughters who have abandoned your home of hinduism and have gone into you know other faiths and therefore let's do some returning home ghar vapasi like something like the prodigal son has done in the bible so paul was involved in that kind of ghar vapasi action and it was use of force as well that was involved in paul's life right he was threatening people to convert back to judaism and to leave christianity that's the kind of person that he was so he was not just a part of a very elite group he was a very religious person and also a very zealous kind of person very zealous for his faith and so he did not want to see judaism being attacked by christianity he wanted to bring everyone back into the jewish fold because he felt like these people are following this christ who was crucified and is dead and is gone and these people are making stories about his resurrection how dare they how dare they cheat people out of judaism and you know how the story unfolds right on the road to damascus he meets with the risen lord he encounters christ whom he thinks is dead and gone and this encounter with jesus changes his life completely he realizes that what the christians are saying is true that the jesus whom we crucified and put into the tomb is no longer there he has risen from the dead because i have just had an encounter with him and his whole theology begins to change his understanding about god his understanding about salvation his understanding about the people of god his understanding about the end times everything undergoes a serious change and then a few years later he begins his missionary journeys right he's traveling from city to city establishing churches and he once he has appointed a few leaders there he moves to the next place establishes a church there appoints a few people there as leaders goes to the next church next place starts a church there and moves on missionary journeys the second and the third missionary journeys he does a lot of visiting the earlier places where he went to visiting these churches that he has established and by AD 60 or 61 he is in Rome now and he is a prisoner of Christ Jesus that's Paul the person who is writing the letter a brief introduction to paul a brief introduction to philemon already was given the person to whom the letter is being written now the third person the person for whom the letter is being written now onesimus the word onesimus means useful all right and he was a slave at the house of philemon now we do not know what exactly he did at the house of philemon but he had to run away from the house of philemon and if somebody in a small town or a small village does a serious crime to run away from the law he would run to a big city right because he would be hidden lost among the masses of peoples right so here is onesimus who is a slave at the house of philemon who does something wrong there and runs to rome to escape punishment right and god's sovereign hand again the sovereignty of god the in the divine provision of god there is a meeting between paul and onesimus paul while he is in house arrest he is free to meet people and god makes these divine appointments and this is one of those divine appointments where onesimus has the opportunity to meet with paul and paul has this habit of sharing the gospel with everyone that he meets with and therefore he shares the gospel with onesimus as well and onesimus is convinced about the truth of the gospel and he becomes a christian all right and there is this imaginary conversation that i want to bring before you that takes place between paul and onesimus so paul asks onesimus gentlemen where are you from so onesimus says i am from the city of colosse So Paul says Colosse I know people there in Colosse you know like we Malayalis we talk Natalivada you know so and so place oh 
we're there, you know, something of that sort. So Paul is asking Onesimus, where are you from, Colossae? So he says, I know people in Colossae. And he says, do you know the man by name Philemon? You know, that sends shivers down uh, Onesimus' spine, right? Because he has just run away from Philemon. But Onesimus trusts Paul, and he says, actually, I was a slave at his house, and I have run away. All right? Paul asks, what have you done? So probably he has stolen something from Philemon's house. And therefore he says, I have stolen something or I have done some damage to him. And so I have run to Rome to escape punishment. I think Paul prayed over this matter and came back to Onesimus another time. Now, by this, by this time, Paul and Onesimus are closely related to each other. You know, Paul calls him his son. I will be reading those verses. Onesimus is helping this old man in doing his ministry and other things. So they have a close relationship going on, Paul and Onesimus. In fact, I, should, I think I should read that out to you. Look at what he says in verse 10. Paul says about Onesimus, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. What does Paul call Onesimus? My son, my son. You know, that's Paul's relationship with Onesimus. He calls him my son, who became my son while I was in chains. That means he's not my physical son. He's my spiritual son, and he was born to me when I was a prisoner in chains. That means I had the privilege of bringing him to Christ while I was a prisoner of Christ. Verse 11 uh, we will come back to that. So Onesimus and Paul are having this conversation. And Paul says, Onesimus, you know what? I think you need to, you are very helpful to me here. And I would want you to continue to be with me here. But I think it would be a good idea for you to return back to your master, Philemon, and ask him for forgiveness. And he would forgive you. Just imagine that conversation that must have taken place. Onesimus' initial response, I believe, was, no way, Paul, I'm not doing that. You know what could be done to slaves if we went back to our masters. We are talking about 2,000 years ago. They could be punished, they could be seriously harmed, even killed, right? So no way, I'm, I'm not going there. And Paul says, you know what, I will write a letter of recommendation for you. Take that letter of recommendation and go to Philemon's house. Give him this letter and say that Paul has given you this letter. Let him read it. He will accept you back. I believe Onesimus was very hesitant in either accepting the letter of recommendation or going back to Colossae or giving that letter of recommendation to Paul. And you ask, what is that? Where is that letter of recommendation? That's the passage that we have read this morning. This book of Philemon is a letter of recommendation that Paul is writing to Philemon for his spiritual son Onesimus, right? So he is writing to Philemon. Now, I was thinking to myself, Onesimus must have left Rome and traveled to Colossae. In the middle of his travel, he must have thought, is it a good idea to really go back to Colossae? You know, I, I might just tear this letter up throw it in a garbage can, and then go my own way. If Onesimus did that, this letter would not have been in the New Testament, right? Onesimus must have been tempted to do that, especially because he was afraid of the consequences that could befall him. And yet, I believe strongly that he came to Philemon's house and he presented this letter to Philemon. Imagine that scene where Philemon is in his big house and Onesimus comes one afternoon, four o'clock, tea time, knocks on the door. Let's say Philemon went himself to open the door. No masks wore then, worn then, right? He could see, this is Onesimus. How dare you, Onesimus? How come you come back? So Onesimus has says, Master, before you say anything or before you do anything, I have a letter from your spiritual guru, Paul. I want you to read that letter. And so he opens this letter and begins to read. And he comes to verse 8 where Paul is telling him, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. So here is a man, Paul, whom Philemon respects a great deal. 
And Paul is telling him, I could actually order you to do what you're supposed to do, but I'm not going to do that. I will appeal to you on the basis of love. Gentlemen, I'm pleading with you. All right, so he wants to read the letter quickly. So he says, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul reminds him that I'm an old man now. I'm also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. And Philemon is shocked by seeing that word son being used for Onesimus, right? Who became my son while I was in chains. Okay, so you have come to faith. You know, Philemon just lifts his eyes from the letter and he looks at Onesimus. Gives a nod, goes back to reading the letter. Formerly he was use, useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Now Paul is actually playing with words here. See the word Onesimus means useful. So you know how the statement would read? Formerly he was non-Onesimus to you. He was not useful. He was useless to you. Non-Onesimus to you. But now he has become Onesimus both to you and to me, all right? I think a smile on Philemon's face as Paul is playing with words here, all right? And so Paul continues, Philemon reads, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. So Onesimus is not just Paul's son. He calls him a piece of my heart. You know, I am sending a piece of my heart. And a hridayatindi uri kashnate nyanangot aiki you know, that's Paul speaking to Philemon. That's just me translating into Malayalam. I'm sending it to you. I would have liked to keep him with me because he is of great help, you know, so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. I, I actually wanted him to be here, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. So I wanted him to be here. He was very useful. He's very Onesimus to me. But then I thought I would send him back. So Paul, verse 15. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. Now Paul is this man who wrote in the book of Romans that God is able to convert all things into good. Right? This is the same gentleman, Paul, Romans 8 who says that God can convert all things for good for those who are loving God and are called by him, right? So that same Paul is saying, Philemon, I think Onesimus left you and it was not good. Uh, he did something wrong there. Again, not good. But probably God has the ability to convert all of this for good. And his separation from you for a little while has ultimately resulted in good. So, what should you do? You might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. So you are to accept him back, not as a slave, but as a dear brother. Now, I want you to see three people, each of whom have encountered the cross. Paul has encountered the cross, received forgiveness from there. Philemon has encountered the cross and has received forgiveness from there. Onesimus has encountered the cross and has received forgiveness of sins from there. And these three individuals are in a special kind of dynamics now. Paul is asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus for the wrong that he has done to Philemon. All three of them have encountered the cross. All three of them know what forgiveness means. So he says, I want you to accept him back, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, Paul says, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. In other words, Paul is telling Onesimus, forgive him. Uh, Paul is telling Philemon, forgive Onesimus and accept him back accept him back. Verse 17, look at what Paul says. So if you would consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Look at that statement. If Paul were to stand at Philemon's house and knock, and Philemon were to open the door and see Paul there in front, how do you think Philemon would have received Paul into the house? 
right? Great warmth, great welcome, great hospitality, great treatment, everything great, right? Now, Paul is asking Philemon to receive Onesimus like he would have received Paul. So if you consider me a partner, all right, don't even consider me a pastor. Don't look at me as someone who has brought you to faith. Look at me as someone who is your fellow partner. Receive this gentleman like you would receive me. If he has done you any wrong, this is Paul again, or owes you anything, charge it to me. In other words, if Onesimus has cost you some money, let's say he stole 100 gold coins from you, and that's what you have lost because of Onesimus, charge it to me. Put it onto my account, all right? I will pay it back. L listen to verse 19. Verse 18 again, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Verse 19, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Sometimes Paul has this habit of dictating things to people and other people write it down. But he says, Philemon, you recognize my handwriting, don't you? I'm writing this with my own hand. And he says, I will pay it back. If it's 100 gold coins, 100 gold coins. I will pay it back back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. That means if you forgive this person, you would be encouraging me and you would be refreshing the heart of this old man who is also a prisoner for Christ. Refresh my heart, Philemon, is what Paul is saying by forgiving this mutual brother of ours who is Onesimus. Now, what do you think Philemon did after reading this letter thus far? Of course, there is other things which Paul says, prepare a room for me. I hope to be restored to you. And when I come to you, I want that room to be ready for me and those kinds of things. But, what do you, but let's say Philemon stopped reading the letter right here. What do you think he did? He had again two options, just like Onesimus had the option of tearing the letter and throwing it away. Philemon had the option of saying, who does Paul think he is? Of course, he brought me to faith. I understand that. But then, isn't this my slave? Shouldn't I have justice? Shouldn't he be punished? I tear this letter away and put it into pieces. You know, throw it in the garbage can. If Philemon would have done that, again, this letter would not have been in the New Testament. I believe that Philemon folded the scroll put it in his back pocket, all right, and then said, Onesimus, come on in. Please sit on the sofa. I'll have some tea made for you. And what would you love, like to have for lunch or dinner or whatever? I, I'm supposed to receive you like I'm supposed to receive Paul. So Onesimus, come on in. I, I think that's the time when Onesimus' heart began to beat normally, right? Up until now, it was racing because he didn't know what would happen. Three brothers in the Lord. One brother who wants to get two other brothers reconciled with each other. And to get that reconciliation done, he says, if I have to pay for it, I will pay for it. You guys reconcile with each other. One fellow has done wrong. He is sorry for it. He's asking for pardon. All right. He is ready to lower himself and ask for pardon. The other person is ready to forgive the other person. Three brothers in the Lord. And I believe this letter and this story of Philemon forgiving Onesimus became famous in the New Testament church in the nearby areas. Because Colossae, Onesimus probably began to attend the church that was continuing to meet at Philemon's house. The story spread. Onesimus has come back and Philemon has accepted him. You know, a slave is a brother now, a very radical kind of thing to happen in those days. The message spread that Paul has written a letter like this. Copies were made, I believe, of this letter and sent out to people. Everybody read this letter. Something great has happened in Colossae. And I believe during the time of the canonization, there were enough number of letters and people were sure of the authenticity of the letter and the story behind it that it became part of the New Testament. A personal letter written by one individual to another individual became part of the New Testament because of the great message that it carries, the message of forgiveness. 
That's the message of the cross, is it not? That's the message of the gospel, is it not? That's the message for all of us this morning. That we must forgive. No matter who has done what, we must forgive. I remember as a young boy, my mom used to read some books to me in Malayalam. My dad had a whole lot of books, and there was a book where Pastor K.E. Abraham's preachings were written. I remember that one of his preachings was about the heavens opening, and he had seven instances in the Bible where the heavens opened, and I read that, and as a teenager, I have preached it in a few places as well, copied it and preached it. I think it's there that Pastor K.E. Abraham says that think of this letter as a letter that Jesus is writing to God the Father for you and me. So Jesus is Paul. God the Father is Philemon, the person to whom the letter is being written. And you and I are Onesimus. And then reread this letter. All right. So Jesus is saying, of course, this is an analogy and there is a limit to how much you can push an analogy. All right. But still, you know, Jesus says, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, Jesus is talking about you and me. He or she was useless. All right. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. All right. And therefore, Father, accept him or her like you would accept me. And therefore, we have entry into God's presence like Jesus has entry into God's presence. We come boldly into the Holy of Holies because we have a door opened for us through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. God and Jesus is telling God the Father, if they have done wrong, not if they have done wrong, all the wrong that they have done, charge it to me. I will pay it back. He already paid it on the cross. You see? So look at this letter as a letter that Jesus is writing to God the Father on your behalf and mine. And God the Father receiving us as he would receive Christ Jesus into his presence. I have five more minutes. There is a parable that Jesus said once. Peter came to Jesus and asked Jesus, Jesus, how many times do you think I should forgive? Is seven times a good number? You know, he thought Jesus would pat him on the back and says, seven times is really good. Keep it up, Peter. You, you are, you know, really becoming my disciple. But Jesus says, not seven times, 70 times seven. And then Jesus goes on to tell this parable of a king and two servants, right? You're familiar with the parable. The king has two servants. The first servant owes him 10,000 talents, right? The king calls the servant and he says, where is my money, buddy? Give it back to me. He falls on his knees and he says, I don't have the money now. Give me time. I will pay it back. The king has mercy on the servant and he says, you don't need to pay me back. Go away. 10,000 talents, debt is canceled. This go guy walks out of the palace and into the street and he finds a fellow person who owes him 100 denarii, catches him by the collar, shakes him in the air and asks him, where is my $100? This guy, B, does the same thing that the first person, A, did in front of the king. He falls on his knees and he says, give me some more time, I will pay it back. There's no way. I'm going to put you in jail. And the second person who owed just 100 denarii is put into jail. The king, got, king heard about what the first servant has done to the second servant, and he catches and punishes the first servant. And Jesus says, this is how it would be with everyone who would not forgive other people the wrongs that they have done. Now, hang on with me as you do a little bit of arithmetic here, all right? 10,000 talents is a huge, huge amount. You may have heard this probably. If you have, please bear with me. One talent is 6,000 dinarai. One talent is 6,000 dinarai. One dinar is one day's pay. So for 6,000 dinarai, you need to work for 6,000 days, right? So 10,000 talents is 10,000 multiplied by 6,000 dinarai. All right, I don't have the calculations right now with me here, but you have your smartphones and all that. Go back home and multiply 10,000 by 6,000 and try to find out how big an amount that is. Now, if this guy works for one dinar a day, every day, how many days do you think it would take him to get this amount of money? 
Do you know it would require him to live for more than 100,000 years? It would require him to live for 100,000 years, work every day, earn a dinar every day, save it, not use it for clothing or food or rent or mortgage or anything of that sort. He has to save all and then at the end of 100,000 plus years, he will have enough money to give back to the king. Moral of the story, the king forgave person A a debt that he could never, ever pay back, right? Person A to person B is not ready to forgive him a debt of 100 denarii. The 100 denarii means you work for 100 days, but he needs something to eat, right? Let's say he worked for 200 days, saved 100 denarii, gives him back the 100 denarii. In other words, this debt is a debt that can be paid back, right? The first debt was a debt that he could not, humanly speaking, pay back. And so the king forgives person A a debt that he can never, ever pay back, and this person does not forgive the next person a debt that he could pay back. Jesus is telling us that God has forgiven us something like 10,000 talents. He has forgiven us all of our sins. And therefore, a debt that we could never, ever pay back. And then we have our brothers and sisters who speak evil of us or have done harm to us. That's like 100 denarii. And therefore, for us, if we find it difficult to forgive someone, we must ask ourselves, how much is it that God has forgiven me? It's something like 10,000 talents. When it dawns on us, the realization that God has forgiven me a debt that I could never, ever pay back in my life, that's when it becomes easier for us to forgive the 100 denarii or the 200 denarii or the 300 denarii that people owe to us. The letter of Philemon is a letter that asks us to forgive. And my prayer this morning is that we ask ourselves, is there anyone that I need to forgive from the depths of my heart? And if you're finding it difficult to ask yourselves, how much has God forgiven you? 10,000 talents, then 100 denarii is nothing much. And therefore, may God help us, like Philemon, to forgive the Onesimuses that we may have in our lives. God bless everyone.